So this time I'm going to talk about um, um, an introduction to the simplified wrapper and interface generator, it's commonly known as SWIG. So if you say SWIG to somebody, they know what you're talking about usually, um, at least in the Python world. Outline of my talk is basically like this. I'm going to introduce you to SWIG, what SWIG is, what it does, and I'm not going to get into the details of how SWIG works internally. Instead, I'm going to focus on how you can use SWIG okay. and then focus on a specific detail called the interface file, which you'll understand and give you a bunch of examples about how you can actually do real life things with an interface file. As we saw in, in some of the examples which are excited, writing things in pure Python is ridiculously slow, especially if you're doing for loops. But the nice thing about Python is it lets you prototype your algorithms extremely rapidly. So in half a day, you're finished writing your core algorithm. You know how it should look, you know how it should be written. And then it's time to say, okay, let me write that in C and speed it up. And we saw that you can actually get a thousand fold speed incre increase of the order off if you go to C directly. So how do you now go about doing this? One way is to use weave, but often it's not enough Supposing you have a more complicated situation. So for my, in my case, uh, during my PhD, I had to build a particle-based solver. And it's absolutely not clear as to how you can do things with arrays. You need an object-oriented hierarchy. You want to do things uh, where C++ is probably better suited. So that's the, that's the premise I started on first. So I went ahead and built a huge C++ library in respect of being an engineer and not a computer scientist. So it ended up being something like 30,000 lines of C++ code. And then I found that just doing the, doing experimentation, figuring things out was just so inconvenient with C++ that I had to wrap it to Python. And I, I just started using Python. And to do this, it really helps if you have an automated tool like F2Py. So think of Swig like F2Py, but which can actually deal with a really complex language like C++. So I had, I was using fairly sophisticated features in C++ like templates. Um, I was using containers. I had inheritance trees and I could derive classes from Python. I had, it's a large code base, so I had lots of documentation. I had written the documentation in the C++ code. I wanted that documentation to be reflected in my Python code so that if people are scripting it, they should be able to look at the docs. So I needed all of this and hand wrapping codes, we have not covered that today, is non-trivial. It's a lot of effort. So what Swig does is, it gives you this approach by which you can actually take a C library and glue it to Python by building an interface, which is basically an extension module. It's very, it's relatively easier to use. You have to learn this, how to big build a Swig interface file. But it does let you wrap C and C++ libraries to various target languages. And it's open source. It supports, at the time when I made this slide, 11 different target languages. Gail, Java, MZ Scheme, I don't know what that is, OCaml, Perl, PHP, Python, Ruby, TCL, Chicken. I don't even know what Chicken is. Okay, it seems it's a language they support, uh, and C-sharp. There's a lot more. Okay, so I think there's a Lua uh, or, um, target language. So basically, they have a generic way by which they parse C++ and generate wrappers for different target languages. And the Python version, which I've highlighted here, is very, is very mature. You can do really lots of neat things with Python wrapping. The chief architect is David Beasley. Um, and the code base has actually been around since 1996, so it's been there for a while. The initial versions didn't have great C++ support. And in 1.3, which is the current development version, they call it the development version, but it's really quite stable. I mean, things change. It's a development version, but it really works, and it works on really large code bases. So I have like 80 classes and things like that, which just wrap and build, no problems. Um, the nice thing about Swig is it's implemented entirely in ANSI C and the sources that it generates, the wrapper codes that it generates, I'll explain what that is in a bit, are implemented entirely in ANSI C. So which means if you have really complex code 
and you're generating a wrapper, it's not using any sophisticated C++ feature, which takes hours to compile. So if you actually have very sophisticated C++, uh, if you're using template meta programming and things like that, it could take you an hour to compile some bit of code because it can get so complex that the compiler has to figure out way too much. Whereas switch generates pure ANSI C, which is a lot easier and a lot faster to compile. Is also highly extensible and configurable using what's called type maps, which I will not be covering in this talk. Um, so basically, the way it works is, in your C language, you have basic types like integers, floats, character strings, null terminated character strings. You have structs and classes. Now, all of the basic um, types. Swig handles, tries to handle it natively. But anything more complex than that, it deals with it as a pointer. So I'll come to that in the next slide. But the basic features is it lets you actually deal with data types, structures, classes. It will let you deal with pointers, references, and smart pointers to an extent. It will deal with functions. It also deals with function overloading pretty well. Um, it supports inheritance, which is pretty amazing. What you can do is, you have a class in C++ and you have a virtual function for that class and now you can actually derive that class in Python which means if you pass a derived object from Python to a C++ function it will actually call the Python code which is very neat. So if you want to do something and test something out you can do it. Um, it supports function and operator overloading. It supports templates. It supports C++ exceptions. It also supports some of the standard uh, library containers like vector, um, map, and it also supports NumPy arrays. It basically, there, was a, there were various wrappers for NumPy array support. And what Bill did was he put them together and really made it nice and had some very good documentation as well to it. So basically, we have a C function. We'll look at an example later. You can actually send it a NumPy array. You can do things like that. So it's extremely convenient. It's available on most GNU Linux distributions. There are, it's available on Mac ports for the Mac. Nthought eggs for the Win32 for Win are available. Um, there's, it's very well documented. Huge amount of documentation. Okay, so with all that done, how do you use Swig? So first, let's say we have some library called libA. Um, so let's say you've built a bunch of functions. Let's say you've implemented sign, you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't do that, but let's say you did. You implemented sign, you implemented a root finder, you implemented some derivatives, you did some calculations. And you see that some of these things can be reused. Let's say you have sine and cosine. You have lots of other code that's going to use sine and cosine. So you want to put that together in one thing where you can reuse it. So the way you do it in C++ is you build or C. I'm going to use C and C++ interchangeably, which is not right, but... So you build a header file which declares your functions and your classes. It basically says this is what it is. These are the, this is the kind of API that I have. And then you implement the details of each of those functions in a .c or .cpp or .cxx file. Now, you don't want every time somebody who wants to use your functions to have to build your code. So you want to give him something that's reusable. So what you do is you build a library. And typically you build what's called a shared library. A shared library basically has all of this code that you've written that's compiled into object code and put together inside what's called a library file. And typically a library file under Unix looks like some lib something dot so. So stands for shared object. You also have what are called static libraries called then they typically look like lib something dot a. Okay, which is basically an archive file which has all your object files. Now, if somebody comes along and wants to use your library, what you do is you take his header file, you include the header file, you all know what including header files in C, C, right? So, you include the header file, code against the guy's API, and now you need the object code. The object code is sitting in the library. So, you link to that person's library. So, the way in which you make reusable pieces in C is you build libraries. You give them header files and you give them library code. Then you write an executable or some other library that 
links to this particular library and uses the header file. So is that clear? So now let's say you have a shared library lib A. Now what Suite does is it parses the header file. That means it looks at the signatures of your functions and your classes and it uses for help an interface file. So the interface file basically guides the wrapping process. A lot of it is done automatically but you can help it along. And then it generates two files. It generates a Python interface and a C++ or a C uh, code which actually wraps your Python, your, your C, your library. So it builds a uh, piece of code that creates what is called a Python extension. You did extensions, right? Okay. So basically the extension is something that can be imported from um, Python and used using a Pythonic interface. Then once you have the a wrap.cpp, you build it into a Python extension and I will show you how to do that. And then all you do is you import the generated py file, the Python module and that is it. You can call your code. It is as straightforward as that and usually what people do is you put all these four steps into things like make files or a setup.py or an scon script. So let us look at the details. So as I said, your library is sitting here. You have some a.cpp and a.hpp let us say and you have built a shared library called lib a.so. We will look at how you do that but let us say you have it. Now you take swig, give it an interface file sitting here, the green guys and swig then passes the header files, generates a wrapper code. The wrapper code in turn is using your header file. It is a C plus, it is a C program and so it also generates what is called a shadow module called a.py. Now you sit and build this a.wrap using what is called the Python C API. So Python basically has a C API which lets you do things from C with Python. So this a.wrap cpp that is generated by swig uses Python C API to manage getting inputs, returning values, doing all of that stuff. So you use GCC or whatever compiler to build an extension module. So now if you just forget about the this entire side, in your Python side all you do is you import the shadow module. The shadow module imports the extension module which in turn is linking to your shared library. Swig looks at header file, generates a wrap. A wrap is built to give you a underscore a.so which is an extension module, it is not a shared library. Python then imports a.py which is a shadow module that Swig generates, <coughs> it is automatically generated and this guy imports the extension module and gives it a nice Pythonic interface. You can use a underscore aso, that is fine but it is not a very clean interface. a.py gives it a clean interface which underneath is actually calling your library. So now you have a library and a header file and you have actually exposed that into Python. Okay, so how do you do this? So let us just do a quick GCC primer. I am only going to cover Unix because the examples today are the lab session is also on, only on Unix. But is the Win32, Sigwin is similar on Win32. So if you have Sigwin, it is pretty much the same. The Ming W is the same. Okay, so Min, Ming W is what they use. And if you use the Nthought edition, you, it comes with Min, Min GW. So, and you can build it pretty much the same way. But I am going to do the details here so you understand how it actually works underneath. A lot of this is made easier by using what are called setup.py files. But I am going to sort of expose the underneath just for this part. Um, basically you use GCC to build object code from C code and the typical options that you will see are minus C which is to compile object code and not build an executable. So when you build a C file, Usually it expects something called main, it is a convention. And basically when the program starts it jumps to main and starts executing from there. Whereas when you say minus C it does not expect that, it knows that it is supposed to be library code that is going to be compiled, it is not expecting anything, it is not going to generate an executable, it is just going to generate an object file which can be bundled together to generate a library. 
Um, you can optimize the code. GCC has a whole bunch of optimizing op options. I would seriously recommend that if you are going to use GCC at some point in life, you should do man GCC. There is a huge amount of information. Just look at it once so you know what is there. Um, there are various options. You typically use minus capital O2. Um, if you are building um, a shared library, it is a good idea to add the flag minus F capital P capital I capital C and when you build a shared library you use minus shared don't worry this is just I'm just listing out the options we will do an example now when the C compiler needs to compile your code and you are including other people's libraries the compiler needs to know where to find those libraries okay so the compiler is told where those libraries the the header files are by giving a minus capital I flag. You give it a directory, you can only specify one directory at a time, so minus I directory, minus I another directory, so on and so forth. And GCC will go to those directories and hunt for headers. Minus L is similar with libraries. So when you are linking your application or your library, you need to know where the other libraries are. So you tell GCC, hey, the libraries are here in this directory. And so you use a minus capital L directory. And again, so one, one each. Finally, when you want to link to a particular library, you say minus L library name. So let's say you have a library called libmath.so or libmath.a. You will say minus L math. So let's say how we build a library from a simple a.cpp. So you first generate the object file, you say gcc or g++ minus c a.cpp. Give it whatever flags and minus o will generate an output file into a.o. And then you build a shared library. You say g++ minus shared, give it the object file and stick that into minus o lib a dot so. And this flag minus shared tells it that the output has to be a shared library. A shared library has a specific format. So the instant you tell GCC to do this, it does the necessary work in order to get this done. And when you link it, you need to specify the library paths and a minus l lib name. So again using a make file or scons makes life a lot easier or a setup.py. So now you have the lib a.so which is your library and you want to now use swig on it. So let us say you have built an a.i interface file, we will come to that next. <coughs> All you do is you say swig minus c++ if it is c++ code minus python which says swig please generate c++ uh, for, for the c++ code generate python wrappers. So if you had minus, if you want to use TCL wrappers, you use minus TCL. And any other extra swig options which you can find using swig minus help, minus o, the file you want to generate and the interface file. So I will just recap, you have a library, C library that is consisting of a header file and a library. The library can be built using GCC as I just indicated or anything else. And now you have an interface file that lets you interface this library into python. So now you say swig minus c++ minus python, any other options for swig, generate the wrapper file and the shadow class, the shadow python file using this a.i. Then you get a wrapper file. You build the wrapper file again using this approach where you say again gcc minus O2, platform independent and you point it to the python headers. So when you build the wrapper, the A wrap, it is basically calling into the python C API. So python has its own header files and you need to point to those. So this basically tells you how to point it to that. So minus i, that will point it to that, to that directory. And then you generate the wrapper code and you build the extension. Building the extension is exactly the same as building your shared library. Very similar flags, very similar. So it is just GCC minus G++ minus shared minus O underscore A.SO. The underscore A.SO is a convention and you must stick to it Okay, when you build swig. Okay, and then the user simply imports A.py and that is it. Okay, so what is the big picture on this? This is like a recap. Um, plus a little bit of internals of how actually swig does this job. So first thing is swig preprocesses all input. So swig interface file 
will actually pre-process, C, C has a pre-processor, you, you are aware of that, you can do if defs, you can have conditional code using, pre, using the pre-processors. Um, so Swig has its own pre-processor, it will process, pre-process your header file, so you can actually tell it to define certain things and undefine certain things if you want. And then it parses the C++ declarations that you give it, either through a header file directly or explicitly in the interface file. And then it keeps an internal representation of whatever you have given it. So this is very useful when you are trying to do inheritance and things like that. Because it keeps track of it and lets you do all of that properly in Python and then has to generate the suitable Python shadow class. And then it generates the wrapper code for the target language. So basically it parses it, keeps a representation and depending on which target language you want, it is going to generate that suitable code. So it is very nicely designed that way. So what it first does when it generates Python code is, it converts all the basic types to equivalents in Python. So if you have an integer, it converts it to the suitable integer type in Python and it has the basic code for all of that. Now the trouble is if you have a class or a pointer, there is no native representation of these in target languages. So what Swig does is it basically replaces each of these by an, a pointer, an opaque pointer, which basically means you don't ask what's underneath. You just wrap that pointer, the address of that pointer, and pass the address of that pointer into the target language. Whenever you need this pointer, Swig has code which will take that pointer, unravel it, get the actual pointer, and pass it along to the C library. So your C library doesn't care because it's getting the pointer. Your Python code doesn't care because it's just de dealing with some string of sorts. And that's it. It used to be a string, it's no longer a string right now. You have pointers and pointers are non-trivial to express, you can't express them in Python. There is no pointer in Python. So what Swig does is it converts anything that's not a simple basic type in Python to something like a string internally. And as when it calls from Python into C, it takes that, unravels it, gets the actual pointer and sends it in. So basically what they say is everything else is treated like a pointer and it works. So basically, yeah, as I said, Swig encodes the pointer into some form in Python like a string with an encoded address and passes it along, that along to any C or C++ functions. The shadow class is responsible for making, giving you a nice interface into how to use it from Python. Now in all of this, let us say you have a NumPy array. That NumPy array you want to send down to C. So how does Swig know how to translate the NumPy array into something that is equivalent in C? The answer is it does not know. So what you can do is you can customize it by writing explicit code to say here is how this type is to be translated into Python. And here is how the Python type is to be translated back into C. Now writing this is non-trivial. You need pretty solid C and C++ and the target language uh, know-how. But the good thing about Swig is most of the dirty work has already been done. So if you look at NumPy wrapping, somebody has already gone and created. Bill Spots has already gone, collected whatever was existing, polished it, improved it and has created something called a NumPy.i header. So it's, it's another interface file which automatically does all of this for you. And you just have to say use this, use this, use this and it will use the suitable wrapping, figure it out for you. So basically it is very customizable, it is customizable by you and you do not always have to do it because most of the times it is already taken care of. So what I will do now is I will take a bunch of explicit examples, I am not going to get into how do you write an interface, how you write the type mapping code which does the mapping of types but I will explain take specific examples and how you translate that into Swig. Swig is huge okay? because you can imagine C++ is a very complex large language and Swig basically can wrap it, can parse it. So it is a very complex piece of software and it has a huge number of options. So I would recommend that you treat this as just a sort of introductory primer around Swig so that you can get started. And if you really want to get your hands dirty with Swig, please read the Swig documentation. It's well written. It's replete with examples. 
and it covers a lot of ground. It's not, it's not. I won't say it's entirely complete with respect to type maps and things like that, but for the basic user, it's really really good. So basically, interfaces, as I said, control how Swig generates the wrapper files. So um, the Swig preprocessor uh, preprocesses all input files, as I said, and you have a bunch of options for that. Um, but Swig itself has its own preprocessor, which is more powerful than the C preprocessor. So which means you can actually define macros in Swig. So a lot of their internals is done using macros. But basically, in an interface file, everything is controlled by what are called directives. And each of these is prepended by a percentage symbol. So here are some common in, um, directives that you will see all the time. So if you put something like this, the code here, percentage header, percentage open curly brace, you can inject any code, C code there, C++ code, which is injected into the wrappers headers section. So if you want to declare something, you want to include some files, all of that can be done at this point. If you don't put a header, you just say percentage curly brace close, percentage close, then it's the same as header, it's just a shorthand for header. The other thing is sometimes certain Python modules need some specific code to be called when they are imported. So if you look at NumPy arrays, they need some setting up that you have to do. And that is usually encapsulated in a single function or a few functions. So in NumPy, you have to say import array all the time. So there's another header section, there's another section directive called percentage init, which will make sure that whatever code you put there gets injected where the module is going to be initialized. Okay, so you have a header section where it goes in the headers, you have init which goes into module initialization. The other common directive is inline. So if you look at any of the Swig examples, there are a lot of them, they have about um, hundreds of tests. Okay, they run a test suite and all of them will use inline. Inline basically lets you put C++ or C code as you see here and parse it. So there are two steps. One is the header file, which goes in the headers section, which basically is the declaration of your functions or your classes. The other is Swig parsing those declarations. So basically you have a header section. So when you're compiling the C code, you need headers. So things need to be injected like include so and so, needs to be injected there. But you also need Swig to know that I want you to parse this code explicitly. I want you to generate a wrapper for this code. What inline does is it does precisely that. It injects it in the header and also parses it. So it's convenient. And it's often used to generate what are called wrapper functions. Okay, so here's the simplest C++ example code. So here is a simple library. It's a stupid library. I say if and def example. This is just a what's called an if def guard, which means the header file will not be included twice, which is a problem. If you do two definitions of a uh, function, it's an error in C, right? You can't, if you have long fact const long n, if you have another long fact with a long argument, it's illegal. So this if def guard is something you'll commonly see in well-written libraries, will basically prevent this from occurring. You'll never, you'll never include it twice. If so two guys are including the same thing, it will not be re-included. So this is example header file. The bottom one is the example C++ file, which is just a silly implementation, which just returns the factorial in a recursive manner. Okay, very straightforward. So this is how you wrap it. It's as simple as this. You say module is the first directive. It says the name of the module to generate will be example. So it will generate an example underscore wrap dot cpp and an example underscore example dot py, which is the shadow module. And you are really interested in the example dot py. Then you're saying in the header section, you include the example dot hpp. And then you're saying include example dot hpp here. What include does it takes the contents of the header file and parses it. Instead of doing the include, you could have just cut and paste this. You don't even need all of this because you don't want the if defs. You could have just cut out float my constant and long fact const long and dumped it here. 
you don't have to use the include swig will treat it as if you want this to be parsed and that's it and now you comp you compile it generate the extension import example it will work now this is extremely simple so now you want to complicate things so again i'm going to do very basic things here look at the swig documentation for a detailed guide so it's easiest usually it does work especially now swig has matured quite a bit you just say include header and it usually works now if swig hasn't passed a particular structure it treats it like an opaque object so let's say i have a header the header is referring to some object which i have not wrapped so let's say i have something that deals with file pointers so file capital f i l e is a c structure to deal with files right and let's say i'm not going to sit and wrap the file structure but my code happens to use file pointers it doesn't matter it will still work so if you say f open f open will return a file pointer swig doesn't care so swig will return some wrapped pointer and give it to you you can't do anything with it in python but pass it back but you can pass it back and once you pass it back swig knows how to deal with that and send it in so this will work so if it's if it's not something that swig has passed and it knows the data structure it will treat it like something that's transparent and it will just pass it along between here and there so it works any global variables global variables are a bad idea but if you do have them um, they typically go in the module if you have my constant in the previous case you'll have example dot c bar which is all the uh, globals dot my constant a better option is to declare it as a const and then it just becomes a const okay which means you can't change it um, and this guy if it's a constant it doesn't go in cvar it's not a variable classes inheritance all of these work as you would expect and if you have operators supposing you have the indirection operator there is no equivalent in uh, python you know the indirection operator less than less than greater than c++ you can't quite wrap them to python so you can ignore some of these but if this is an add or it's a get item um, okay operator bracket i think right that will give you the uh, give you an element inside a container for example that would be wrapped automatically to get item in python so it takes care of all of this for you it also supports c++ namespaces so let's look at a bunch of simple directives and wind up with that some common directives rename will let you rename function so let's say you in c you may define a function called print but print is a keyword in python so you have a problem so if you use the rename directive you are renaming the print that seen to my print now the note the important thing here is you must only include your headers these guys after you have done this because once it's passed it's finished you can't do anything about it so in actuality this should come above this the other thing you commonly need to do is c++ doesn't support multiple arguments you can return a pointer but in python it's natural to return three integers okay so there is a built in called there is a built in set of type maps in a library library head, uh, interface file called type maps and they define what are called input and output type maps which let you do this and this is how it works so let's say i have two functions get size which is basically just setting xs and ys to 100 comma 200 and you want to return this in one case so in this case both x and y are going to be changed in the other case is just returning something so if you just include type maps dot i so if you want to include a library you just say include that thing dot i and then you can what's called apply a type map so you say apply int star output which means apply this specific type map that's defined in type maps dot i to the arguments you see like so so wherever swig sees int star xs int star ys it will automatically inject the type mapping code in order to deal with this as an output so now if i actually in my python wrappers if i called get size it will return a tuple it will return the xs and the ys because it knows that you have explicitly said these two guys have to be output 
so it will automatically output. So it's very convenient. So you can wrap functions like this and make it generate output. Um, in the other case, supposing you have this sub function, subtract, you want it to be passed without creating pointers. You can't create a pointer in Python. You want to call it with an integer, right? I want to call the subtract function with two integers. But the C++ or C function expects a pointer. So this input type map, the instant I've declared something as input in this case, like so, it assumes that the sub function is given two integers. So it will write the wrapper function underneath for you such that when it is called from Python, it's just given two integers, not two pointers to integers. Then it takes those integers, creates the pointers, passes it down to the underlying library. So this is again a very handy type map. So basically type maps in the following fashion. You have a particular signature. You have a particular thing like int star xs, int star ys. And then you've defined a type map of how to handle int star. So all you're doing here is you're saying apply the output type map to these two. And here I have just declared this. This is in the header section. This over here is in the parsing section. So the parser just is told there is a function called sub which is expecting two integers as input. You convert them to pointers underneath. It takes care of all of that. If you want to do overloading in C++, you use what's called the director feature. Okay. So you have to turn on directors at the module level and then turn on director for everything. You can turn on directors for every object or you can generate them for specific objects or for explicit virtual functions that you want to wrap. This will take care of that. It handles templates. The only thing you have to worry about templates is that you have to explicitly instantiate the template. So for instance, if I have a pair template here, I have to make it, I have to create a pair ii, which is basically pair intent. And in Python, I simply say import example as x, p is equal to x dot pair ii and pass it to integers. It, it's, it actually uses the instantiated template. So it basically works. It also deals with um, uh, vectors, std vectors, and you can pass lists and they behave like lists. It also deals with exceptions. So if you have code that explicitly throws exceptions in C++, Swig will take those exceptions, convert them into Python exceptions all for you and do it. So you can actually catch exceptions from your C++ code. It's not going to seg fault and kill your interpreter. You can also document your code. So you can actually pass documentation strings that will be injected into the shadow file. So when you say f, f fact and you're going to type something out, you don't want to do fact question mark and get help, this help will be shown. So you can add that also. So basically your wrapper file lets you build lots of complexity into the generated wrappers. Finally, there's NumPy support. Again, it's the same thing. You have what's called a, a type map and the type map here is called in array for input arrays. And then you have something called in place array for arrays that are going to be changed in the C and being used back. So basically for a NumPy support, you need to basically define in the headers section, define this, declare whatever headers you want. In this particular case, I'm considering one single function. You need to include the numpy.i interface. And then in the init section, as I showed you earlier, you have to do import array, which basically sets up numpy so that it can be used. Now you just need to apply the type maps de declared in numpy for your signature. So all you're saying here is, this is going to calculate the RMS value of some numpy array. You simply say apply in array int dimension to this signature, double star seek in 10. And that's it. So now pipe, the swig will generate a wrapper. Once you compile it, you can actually call this with a numpy array. And it will work on that numpy array and return a double precision number. So basically, you've just done a very, very, very brief. As you can see, Swig is very comp pretty complicated. But for simple things, it's very easy. And you can actually just gradually build your... Uh, the best way is to take one thing, write a function, wrap it, and you say, OK, yeah, things work. Now add one more, keep adding. And then say, OK, let me throw my whole header file at it. Some things may not wrap. And you say, OK, let me improve it. So it's, it's easy to work with it in an iterative way once you have the basics. But this should get you started. Read the Swig docs. Yeah, pretty good. Thanks.